Futurized goes beneath the trends, tracking the underlying forces of disruption in tech, policy, business models, social dynamics, and the environment. Join me, futurist Trun Arne Unheim, PhD author, investor, and serial entrepreneur, as I discuss the societal impact of deep tech such as AI, blockchain, IoT, nanotech, quantum, robotics, and synthetic biology, and tackle topics such as entrepreneurship trends for the future of work. I'm a research scholar in global systemic risk, innovation, and policy at Stanford University. On Futurized, I interview smart people with a soul, founders, authors, executives, and other thought leaders, or even the occasional celebrity. Futurized is a bi-weekly show preparing you to think about how to deal with the next decade's disruption so you can succeed and thrive no matter what happens. Futurized, conversations that matter. If you're new to the show, seek particular topics or are looking for a great way to tell your friends about the show, we've got the episode categories. Those are at futurized.org slash episodes. I am the co-author of Augmented Lean, a human-centric framework for managing frontline operation and the author of Health Tech Rebooting Society Software, Hardware and mindset future tech how to capture value from disruptive industry trends pandemic aftermath how coronavirus changes global society the disruption games how to thrive on serial failure and of leadership from below how the internet generation redefines the workplace for an overview you can go to trondenheim.com slash books at this stage futurize is lucky enough to have several sponsors and to check them out go to futurized.org slash sponsors. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast or to get an overview of other services provided by me, including how to book me for keynote speeches, please go to futurized.org slash store. We'll consider all brands that have demonstrably positive contributions to the future. Before you do anything else, make sure you are subscribed to our newsletter on futurized.org where you can find hundreds of episodes of conversations that matter to the future. Please also leave a positive review on iTunes. Thanks so much. Dan, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hey, I'm well. Thanks, Tron. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about this. Look, we've known each other for, I guess, two years now, almost two years, Dan. Going on, yeah. Yeah. And in that time, we've had some pretty remarkable experiences working on existential risk research at Stanford. So I'm bringing you here to learn more about you. I hope that uh, we can uh, discover some things about you, Dan, because you're an exciting guy. I'm going to start with a super brief and butchered biography. I'm going to see if I have this uh, this straight with you here. So Dan Zimmer, right? Uh, PhD in government from Cornell. And uh, you've been working on uh, Western political thought, uh, especially the historical dimension. Uh, and... Uh, your thesis uh, has been on existential risk historically, right? And That's then right, yeah. over the last few years, you've been working on bringing that up to date uh, with the contemporary discussion, and especially uh, this prospect of machine super intelligence. But I, I noted, I noted a couple of things, and you know, we've talked about this as well. You've also spent some time in Istanbul working on understanding social prote- protest. So you've been you've been mixing. Uh, a lot of different uh, geographical areas and uh, and topics into your uh, engagement. So, was that a fair representation of what you've been doing the last few years, Dan? And you know, obviously, we'll get to the the details. But yeah, it was. Thanks, Trond. That's kind of a decade arc of what I've been doing. I was in Istanbul in 2014, doing research on the recent Gezi Park protests. Uh, back when it looked like uh, Erdogan might only be a ruler for a decade rather than for life. And um, when I went to do my PhD, I thought that it would be on kind of the weaponization of nonviolence and these sorts of kind of contemporary decentralized protest tactics. Unfortunately, when it came time to write my dissertation prospectus, I had one of those moments that every PhD student existentially dreads where I went and I read something and it turns out that my uh, proposal had already been written exquisitely in this case by my undergraduate advisor who it turns out had incepted all of her best ideas into me while she was writing her own book on the subject. (laughs) So I had a chance to go back completely to the drawing board and think, you know, starting from scratch, what is a topic that genuinely interests me? And I realized, I think it's pretty crazy that there are multiple ways that human beings could destroy all human life on earth. And presumably those have important implications for political theory, which as you mentioned, was where I was doing my doctorate at the time. And it's 
crazy that we don't talk about that. So I went to my advisor and I said, hey, I've got an idea. I'm going to do a comparative look at existential risk and political theory um, with nuclear weapons, global warming and artificial intelligence. And he said, great. You know, I can already see the book. Run with it, <laughs> which was super irresponsible on his part. Bit off way more than I could chew. But long story short, by the end of the dissertation, I got into the first two of those topics and really discovered once I dug into the history of it, that nuclear weapons, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, climate and ecological issues are much more closely intertwined than I'd expected. And once you scratch the surface, it became clear that they were part of a much broader syndrome. And so this time with you at uh, Stanford has given me an opportunity to explore how um, artificial intelligence fits into this kind of broader question of technological developments and various areas in which people have been willing to kind of knowingly risk all life on earth for various um, earthly reasons. That's uh, that's super interesting. I don't want to leave that idea of the uh, social movements uh, yet. Uh, I was just curious as as we kind of I, I want to ask you just a little bit about your research, but but in this previous previous framing, it is interesting that social movements do engage on sometimes existential issues, and I guess it's it is still relevant when it comes to the anti war movement and nuclear movement, and perhaps other coming protest movements as well. Does that figure into this historical analysis that you've been doing uh, at all, or are you much more uh, interested in the expert formulations of, of these problems? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the most surprising things that I found in my research is a cyclicality to protest. There's always been kind of a background hum of expert concern, but a real punctuated way in which these things emerge into public and cause kind of mass movements. And interestingly, the first was actually in the wake of the First World War, when the shell shock survivors looked at the immense technical progress that had been made in, you know, killing during the war compared to the absolute, excuse me, um, compared, compared to the absolute lack of political progress by the time the war was concluded and realized that if we have another world war, we might well invent uh, the methods to destroy human life on Earth. So that led to all sorts of world government campaigning to try and end war in the 1920s. And then similarly, with the advent of the hydrogen bomb, it seemed to finally create a means to destroy all life on Earth. And that led to a pretty vigorous campaign for nuclear disarmament in the UK, mass protests that culminated in um, the limited test ban treaty. And then similarly, in the 1980s, the election of Ronald Reagan kind of brought nuclear weapons back to the fore. People felt that the Cold War had been reignited. And there were huge anti-war, anti-nuclear protests in the United States and Germany. It led to you know, material effects like moving the Pershing missiles out of the region. And then more recently in the 2010s, we had things like Extinction Rebellion and um, Sunset Movement, other groups that took a more kind of holistic approach, looking specifically at kind of ecological collapse and not necessarily connected to these earlier anti-nuclear movements. But what's interesting is that each of these different broad scale protests happened about 30 years apart. So it's almost as if every generation has to look up and realize, why is it that we are jeopardizing everything that exists for these seemingly um, parochial reasons of national interest, et cetera, and the revolt? And, you know, heretofore, they've failed in removing those existential risks. And then, nevertheless, we remain. These uh, The missiles haven't gone off. Um, and then a new generation tries again. Yeah, I, I was reminded by this uh, I, I, this week, I guess, because I'm writing a piece on uh, appeasement, which is another, I guess, uh, protest strategy or political strategy that's sort of a little bit out of fashion these days, which is uh, kind of striking because, you know, the core of appeasement, uh, whether it was in the 30s or way before that as a strategy, it is, you know, kind of to to, uh, I guess, engage in concessions to, to avoid uh, war. And it's an interesting thing, you know, if that's out of fashion, then what, what's in fashion, right? <laughs> um, because like you said, we, we have gained these powers. So, I, you know, we're going to uh, uh, go a little bit to talk uh, about the proceedings and the, the f uh, fantastic event that we both uh, were uh, put on at Stanford last year. But I want to ask you maybe before we get there, if you were to just historically, very quickly trace the debate on existential risks in this century, how would you sort of characterize the different 
moments until we get to uh, you know where we were last year uh, with a, a bunch of established and young scholars and, and sort of discuss where we are now with with the scholarship around existential and cascading risks. Yeah, thanks. That's another great question. And just sidebar, I feel like appeasement is just a pejorative term for compromise. And the fact that I mean, it's, it's astonishing the unwillingness to compromise in contemporary politics, even on issues that should be, you know, a net positive uh, win for all sides. So that's neither here nor there. But in terms of the history of how existential risk has been approached, I think it, it's really interesting that there was this moment of just really visceral um, fear in the 1950s that led to famous Cold War documents like the Russell Einstein Manifesto that was read by hundreds of millions of people translated into dozens of languages that threatened universal death by hydrogen bomb and nuclear war and called on people to think of themselves first and foremost as members of the human species and not any sort of national or ideological, ideological, racial, religious creed, et cetera. And really there was this kind of mischance for some sort of world unity where everyone who ostensibly has a primary drive to remain alive as the precondition for achieving every other humanly meaningful goal should have put all their differences aside and secured a safe human future for nuclear weapons. And then kind of having seen people fail to do that and opt for uh, maintaining strategic stability and a balance of terror with nuclear weapons instead, that really killed that movement in the 50s. And it wasn't until the 1980s that you had the rise of things like peace studies, that kind of return of nuclear weapons to popular attention. A lot of um, TV shows and films that address this in really visceral ways, uh, the day after, et cetera, and the discovery of nuclear winter really kind of transformed the terms in which existential risks are thought of. Um, In the 1950s, it was all conceived as kind of a linear threat of um, radiation being poisonous, thermonuclear weapons being able to produce global radioactive fallout, and thereby killing everything on Earth. By the 1980s, you've got three subsequent decades worth of planetary science a large part of which was really enabled by uh, nuclear weapons research. Paul Edwards has a great piece on this in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. But a really dawning awareness with um, the work of Paul Crutzen and Sagan and the TAPS paper that nuclear weapons are a fundamentally ecological threat. So Twilight at Noon, uh, the discovery of nuclear winter, and this realization that the sort of thousand, excuse me, thousand megaton thermonuclear wars that people were gaming out in the 50s and 60s, even if they'd been winnable in air quotes, they would have caused degrees of global ecological uh, disaster that would have killed the vast majority of people then living. So from the 1980s onward, there becomes a real realization that all existential risks are fundamentally ecological and that humans are far more vulnerable once we look at not just how to physically kill every living being, but we look at their reliance on the environments and this tangled, still only partially understood uh, web of relationships that sustain viable human life. And then that kind of led to one way of thinking about existential risk that was institutionalized in various uh, ecology departments and uh, forms of risk studies and the environmental movement. But then you get a very different one that is also born out of the 80s with people like um, Freeman Dyson, K. Eric Drexler, uh, Hans Marevik, people who are looking at advances in computing and particularly the information sciences. So um, Drexler looking at the rise of potential nanomachines, people looking at synthetic viruses, and especially ultimately artificial intelligence and fears of machine superintelligence, this longstanding suspicion that if we produce systems that are as intelligent as human beings and a function of intelligence is the ability to um, you know, produce intelligent machines, then you'll get some sort of um, explosive, recursive um, self-improvement that will leave human beings in the dust. And so there's a very different kind of trajectory of existential risk thinking that comes out of this more uh, information and AI focused field that by the early 2000s had led to um, the rise of the contemporary field of existential risk studies, through the work of people like Nick Bostrom that then becomes institutionalized at the Future of Humanity Institute and also draws on things like um, population ethics and you know various themes and utilitarian and analytic philosophy to come up with very interesting and often counterintuitive 
very rational arguments for um, why existential risk reduction might actually be, given the huge um, scale of the stakes involved, something that makes more sense than seemingly um, more immediately applicable programs to improve the lives of people currently living. And yeah, one of the things that we, I think, addressed in our conference to some extent was this ongoing tension between these two different kind of branches of existential risk thinking, one of which looks at it as primarily a ecological problem with kind of a middle range time scales, and then another looking at it much more as kind of the long-term trajectory of earth originating intelligent life and whether artificial intelligence is kind of the next stage in human evolution or, you know, our near-term end. That's that's super interesting. We're, we're going to jump into the some of the papers in a second, but I just wanted to ask you a little about um, this notion that I that I read into some of this history, which is uh, for a while here, some uh, commentators are sort of assuming that uh, if you if you look at these two factors that you have mentioned, sort of nature, ecology, and technology. And there's sort of two ways, I guess, to look at these factors. They could be sort of exogenous factors that just happen to us, or they could be endogenous factors that, you know, are socio-technical. They are choices we're all making. So, so you, you were making the point that all existential risk is ecological, and I, I think I firmly a- a- agree with that. But I don't think uh, that has necessarily been the perspective always, right? So there's this assumption sometimes that, oh, well, you know, technology just happens to us and we now need to just pre- prepare because these risks, these bombs, these these AIs, they're just coming for us. And what are we going to do then? As if we have no choice in the matter. And then <clears throat> secondly, this whole direction of, you know, worrying about things from outer space coming to hit Earth and, you know, the dinosaurs died from it. And, you know, what, what are we going to do if some some cataclysm happens or, you know, all these natural disasters? Well, are they all that natural, right? You know, we, we sort of created them. So I wanted you maybe to just comment a little bit on uh, historically how this perception of whether we have a choice in the matter has factored into these debates. Yeah, I, some people have quipped that the dinosaurs were wiped out because they didn't have a space program. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I certainly don't stay up at night worrying about uh, asteroids or uh, vacuum bubble decay or also, or you know cosmic rays that could lash the planet. Uh, not a lot you can do about that. Uh, asteroids, thankfully, you know, there's been work to um, monitor the biggest ones and. Uh, with NASA's successive darts, uh, hopefully the beginnings of programs for steering them away when they're detected in time. But yeah, I mean, one of the f- my own findings from my research in kind of the history of Earth system science and thinking about existential risks as fundamentally ecological issues is that everything that happens on Earth is endogenous. Uh, it is all connected. Uh, our degree of uh, ability to actually trace, model, meaningfully anticipate how those connections operate is, you know, growing slowly with time. But for me, I think the kind of key distinction here is between people who stress what you might call wisdom versus intelligence. And this is a split that you begin to notice in the 1970s, where um, 1950s, you have uh, cybernetics, and everyone gets really excited about we're going to toss out all of that humanist baggage, we're not going to think that man is the measure of all things or that, you know, he's a rational animal or that he's somewhere descended from God on a great chain of being between angels and ants. But we're going to approach human beings as complex information processing systems. And when we do that, we realize, well, you know, many things are complex information processing systems from economies to ant hives to um, ecosystems, et cetera. And so, This led to all sorts of really exciting analogies and attempts to kind of rethink human relations, but it also gradually began to split apart over time with some people coming to emphasize the complex systems aspect of human relations. And that necessarily, um, every system only operates in a given environment, which is then a system that has its own environment. So you tug on the complex systems thread and before you know it, you've arrived at the earth system and you have people like Gregory Bateson, Barry Commoner a lot of the kind of most influential, um, Margaret Mead as well, influential environmental and ecological thinkers of the 70s and 80s, uh, developing an awareness that given the degree of uh, complexity and all sorts of feedbacks and uh, nonlinearities in these systems, there is a very 
clear kind of horizon of foreseeability when it comes to human actions. Mm -hmm. And they develop, um, they all kind of spontaneously and independently of each other seem to start talking about wisdom as this awareness of both kind of systemic interconnection, but also kind of a self-limiting virtue that to be wise is to also realize that given the degrees of complexity at play and the unforeseeable consequences and the feedbacks, you can't fully know what will happen in response to your actions. So you should proceed with caution. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have people who really emphasize the information processing elements of discovering that humans are complex information processing systems. And for them, um, information processing becomes synonymous with intelligence. And they begin to view human beings as kind of the apex cogitator and see our role on earth as having kind of occupied this niche, uh, environmental niche of the most intelligent being. And that is kind of both our human uniqueness and our gift to the universe is to kind of further advance the process of intelligence. And for them, intelligence becomes a universal solvent. Um, it's famously tough to define, but for them, it basically means the ability to solve complex problems. So where the kind of systems wisdom camp sees certain elements as kind of insoluble and you just have to live with them and do the best that you can muddling through for mid-range goals, the intelligence people see intelligence as uh, kind of infinitely um, and exponentially scalable. And so scalable, really but also potentially controllable or the, there's the control problem, right? So that, that gets into the debate or of whether we should and whether we can control this new creation of ours. Yeah, pre precisely. Um, it, both camps will arrive at transcendent views. For one camp, it's kind of the earth system and its complexity that's transcendently complex beyond human imagining. For the other group, it's some sort of artificial superintelligence that becomes transcendently complex that will either solve all of our problems or destroy us, depending on what it feels like. So Dan, carrying all of that, um, and you know, I came in with my my own sort of preconceptions, and then we we spent a year almost at, at Stanford, and then we put on uh, together with everyone at uh, Stanford Existential Risks Initiative, we put on this event, uh, just a, a quick context of this was in the spring of last year, uh, it was called Intersections, Reinforcements and Cascades, or it was all about cascading risks. Um, and we brought together a very interesting mix of young and established scholars. And I remember our discussions, you know, who were we going to feature? And we really said we want to have some young scholars as well to really see what's moving and shaking in the field these days. What are some of your initial impressions from that event? What, what kind of reflections did you go into the event with? What surprised you? Uh, what did you learn? Yeah, I learned a lot, frankly. Um, if you look at the field of existential risk studies that's kind of taken shape during the 2010s and early 2020s, it, it seems very homogenous. But when we put out our call for this conference, we got a really uh, surprisingly wide range of responses. And <clears throat> I think it was great that we were able to bring in uh, junior scholars, senior scholars, but also people who are government lab workers, who um, are at various research institutes in the area, who might work on something entirely seemingly unrelated to X risk, but have strong thoughts on it. And it's always, it's been in the back of their mind for a long time. We had people from the business school <laughs> with um, plans for marketing uh, autonomous exogenous wombs that will prevent human extinction by kind of repopulating the planet with human beings uh, following our extinction. So, and then a lot of interest as well from, uh, people in areas that are traditionally not, um, represented like the global South as well. So I thought it was just very neat to see that, um, there was both a lot more interest in a topic that doesn't frequently, um, or at least before the recent AI panic didn't frequently make the news but also a kind of heterogeneity in the ways in which people were approaching these issues that we were able to highlight in the conference and, you know, just bring in voices that hadn't typically featured in these debates before. So, so Dan, uh, I remember uh, Steve Luby, one of the professors, uh, uh, co-founders of, of SERI, he made the point, I believe, during the event that we're perhaps not so much uh, in, in need of this massive a cadre of ex-risk researchers as we are in a more uh, 
kind of global awareness all across academic domains about the importance of taking risks into account. Um, that may be partially true, wholly true, and it, but it has some consequences. Do you think that, you know, I don't, I don't know, just judging from the, the event that you attended, do you think that it would be <clears throat> sufficient and enough to have every academic field start to take seriously the relationships between their individual discipline and these big systems, and you have kind of characterized it, uh, characterized it as you know the Earth system and the intelligence building intelligence system. These two systems. Is it enough that someone in sociology, political science, physics thinks about the re relationships between their discipline and these two sort of movements, or is there a place for a much more all-encompassing X-risk science that would literally perhaps be bigger than system science, but also would perhaps need to develop its own vocabulary so that the people we brought together and others can actually speak uh, a language? Or do you think the scientific language is enough? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, if you talk to a systems theorist, they'd say that nothing is bigger than system science. We will encompass anything that you throw at us in a bigger system. But I think that it's proven really tough for people to do X-risk research within established disciplines. Uh, you even look at someone like Paul Edwards, one of the other uh, co-founders of SERI. He's written brilliant books on AI <clears throat> and its relationship to nuclear weapons during the Cold War, climate change. But, you know, he's before founding SERI, he'd never published anything that was explicitly on existential risk, despite being a leading expert in the field. And then, you know, a lot of people who came out of the woodwork for our conference as well had had papers that had been milling around for a long time. It was exciting that we could help catalyze them. But I think they'd realized that they wouldn't have been professionally rewarded for raising these issues with their colleagues. And then in my own home discipline of political theory, we had a great political theory paper at the conference. But to some extent, one of the findings in my own dissertation research is that Contemporary political theory is constituted by ignoring existential risk, that once you take for granted the fact that some people somewhere can kill everyone everywhere, then foundational political categories like sovereignty, self-determination, basic principles of democratic legitimation all fly out the window. And so this is something that people kind of realized in the 1950s and they had the choice to either fundamentally reformulate political theory for the era of existential risk or ignore it and continue on as normal. And that's what the vast majority of the discipline did. So I think that it would be great to establish X risk as a genuine field. People at CSER, uh, the Center for the Study of Existential, Existential Risk at Cambridge, are doing outstanding work in terms of kind of early discipline building. But it'd be possible to imagine existential risk studies taking shape along the same sort of lines as something like peace studies, where you have a very kind of clear goal and a willingness to develop a kind of general shared vocabulary to discuss it, but also an omnivorous interdisciplinary uh, willingness to engage with any sort of tools that can meaningfully address your problem. I think that's very savvy, but I, I would also say that my observation at the conference, I was sufficiently uh, you know, awed by all the variety, but I think I'm a bit more pessimistic than you and perhaps leaning more towards uh, Steve Luby's point in the sense that you know, transdisciplinarity is one thing, or or even just interdisciplinary collaboration is one thing. That's hard enough. But the whole idea of either A, creating a new discipline, or creating no discipline, but, but having enough sort of, uh, I guess, borderline concepts and uh, translations between that you can communicate, that also seems very hard. But are you are you essentially saying that the discipline of political science, or are you also putting in there the whole issue of governance? Would you say that any governance system out there, and I'm not you know, going outside of the discipline of, of political science, but just m merely think about, thinking about you know, these governance systems that we see, you know, how the U.S. is run, how Europe is building its, its system. Are any of these systems, in your view, able to fruitfully engage with existential risk or are you are you basically saying we would need not just to build a discipline but to build a new society <laughs> well yeah i mean i think we need to 
tear down and start over if you wanted to make a fully existentially risk resistant society, but that's not in the cards. I think that there's been exciting uh, openness on the part of uh, elected leadership in the last couple of years towards really taking existential risk more seriously. Uh, the American military has incorporated global catastrophic risks into some of their planning much more centrally. I know that things at the, with the UK government and uh, the UN, uh, people at the Future of Humanity Institutes and uh, at Oxford and the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at Cambridge have been involved in that. But I think that there's a place for existential risk studies as kind of a field or almost an area studies. And the area is the prospect of uh, a world without human life and the question of how that we prevent that. And that could be a great clearinghouse for ideas that could exist in a kind of robust ecosystem of kind of broader governmental efforts to address these issues. Dan, can we take a step back? And I meant to have asked you this earlier, but we called our conference Cascading Risks for a reason, uh, which is a whole concept. Uh, and we were trying to have the papers ad address this idea of, of, of risks interacting in, in a way. And then, you know, cascade is one metaphor. There are so many metaphors out there. Uh, you have explicitly been talking about existential risks. And indeed, the center where we both work currently is, is called the existential risks, uh, you know, the, the study of existential risk. How do you define X risk or existential risk? And do you think that such a an endeavor would need to agree on this or, or could it exist as a, as it does now, I guess, with at least two main camps and many, many, many different uh, variations of, of what we think we are doing and what our goals are and essentially what our tools are? Yeah, no, great question. I, I think that they're kind of two dimensions there. One is, like you mentioned, what do we mean when we say existential risk? And someone like Nick Bostrom proposed a very uh, widely accepted definition back in 2003, uh, of which he has four different types. Only one entails the complete extinction of human life. And then three others are very kind of normatively laden uh, visions for not succeeding in achieving a fully good view of life, according to some of his criteria. So I think that it's really crucial. And a lot of uh, kind of debate and time and energy is wasted by people talking past one another. When it comes to some people, when they say existential risk, they really mean a risk to civilization or society or global capitalism or a certain way of life, uh, their mode of existence. And then other people mean existential risk as the existence of the human species. And I think people have been worried about the former for millennia and the latter really only realistically since the end of the 19th century. And I think it would be probably important for a field of existential risk studies to include things like global catastrophic risks that some people say would be something that kills say 10 or 20% of the human population that leads to global systemic collapse. Uh, and then maybe existential risk defined in terms of the ex existence of the human species being at stake, a subfield within that, just to create kind of a broader tent, precisely because a lot of the same phenomena could um, affect both outcomes. But yeah, at the same time, I think that once you nail down what you actually mean, whose existence is at risk, uh, what is the referent object of existential risk, then you can kind of create the shared language for engaging in broader methodological questions of whether you should adopt some sort of systems-oriented approach that tries to look at how small, seemingly trivial risks can uh, compound and cascade, or whether you have kind of a megatechnics approach that's really focused on individual kind of isolatable kill mechanisms, as it's called. Hmm. Um, related to this, th there's always metaphor, right, which is useful as a bridging concept in both science and certainly in communication. Is existential a good metaphor? I mean, regardless what it means, what it signals, what does it signal? Well, I mean, it's certainly hugely overdetermined. It, it signals a lot of different things for different people. 
And it's also bound up with questions of philosophical existentialism. But that can also be good insofar as it forces people to realize that what's at issue here is fundamental questions of value and the meaning of life and a willingness to ask, to what extent are we willing to risk the survival of the human species for preserving the existence of a particular way of life? And this comes immediately to the fore in things like nuclear weapons which were adopted not as a existential necessity in the, um, for the survival of the United States in the 1950s, mass thermonuclear retaliation was really kind of a cost-cutting measure by the Eisenhower administration, which wasn't willing to shell out the money needed for conventional deterrence against the Soviet Union. And then similarly, five decades of climate uh, denial, delay, obfuscation, fueled by a desire to not change the way of existence that Americans have enjoyed in a fossil fuel intensive consumer society while kind of knowingly jeopardizing the, um, well, or posing an existential threat to thousands of species and potentially our own, uh, depending on how things shake out. That's a very interesting way of putting it. So our biggest existential threats are cost saving measures. <laughs> that's, that's fascinating. We have knowingly pursued existentially risky technology for reasons of economic expediency. Yeah. Well, that's kind of shocking. Well, let's I mean, go look to at AI. My God, what's happened at OpenAI in the last five years since their founding? Yeah, they were supposed more to be about the good that. guys doing it safely. And uh, now they've all nearly become a for-profit company. Right. And is the for-profit thing a problem or the potential of runaway with the founders and leaders there saying, we can't guarantee that the world's not going to end from our own technology and then keep you know asking for more money to do, do just that? Um, I mean, what are the responsibilities of the critical agents in, in these developments? I mean, if you look at it historically... Uh, just to take it back a second. And, you know, there are some papers at our conference that really dealt with that. We had some very strong arguments uh, from Professor Dupuis on on kind of the, the whole origin of n- nuclearism as a, as a concept and, and why it should be abolished even as a, as a thought. But w- what is your thinking there? And, you know, historically, what, what, have, uh, what has the debate been when it comes to how, uh, where the responsibility lies? Is it with governance or is it with the creators or is it both <laughs> yeah, yeah that, another really great question i i don't know I, I think that frankly the scale of the technologies that we're talking about really exceed uh our inherited uh traditional understandings of what constitutes responsibility hmm. that even as it emerged out of uh, the Enlightenment based on earlier ideas, there is this notion of kind of linear causal um, relationships that make it really easy to kind of attribute blame. And that just hasn't been the case with either the huge projects, the kind of mega techniques that lead to things like uh, the atomic bomb and the infrastructure of thermonuclear annihilation, where you have decisions being made by um, hundreds of thousands of people who are involved in the projects. Uh, It's tempting to blame the person with whom the buck stops. I think that uh, Eisenhower had a placard that actually said that on his desk. And then by extension, you've got the entire electorate who voted the person in. But when this is an issue that directly concerns every living human being on earth, you can't exactly pretend that that was a democratically made decision. So there's a huge democratic deficit. And at the same time, a difficulty in terms of um, yeah establishing this sort of one-to-one cause and effect that we normally associate with responsibility, this really coming to the fore in something like global warming, where it's a mass phenomenon caused by behavior of billions of people and you know correspondingly affects all people. But yeah, again, I think this is just really goes to show the extent to which uh, philosophers, political thinkers, social theorists could really make a huge contribution to recasting some of the kind of fundamental underlying uh, terminology that informs our notions of government. Think things like responsibility for an age of planet scale, uh, systemically interlinked threats. So Dan, I, I want you to be right. 
I want this to be a knowledge problem and an awareness problem, but I suspect that it's more than that. And let me just explain what I think uh, is happening. If it was, and you know, I'm going to ask you a question, are we sufficiently aware of the mechanisms that are producing this calamity, potential calamity? You know, we were talking about cascades at the conference and we deliberately sort of took it to the cascade level because that's a process term that sort of indicates that before there is existential risk, there are smaller risks. And when they uh, potentially uh, collide, you know, in sort of systems complex ways, then eventually things happen. And then you have a bunch of metaphors that try to explain what happens right before that collapse, which, and, and there's the leading one is this idea of a tipping point. Uh, which I think has complexities of its own. And in fact, I'm, I'm working on, on, on that as well. I don't necessarily think that that is a very helpful metaphor. It certainly communicates very clearly from a media point of view right there. And, you know, Malcolm Gladwell and others have popularized this notion that tipping points are just very simple and easy to, to understand, uh, even though they're surprising. So, so my question is, if everybody knew that these things, let's say they were caused by, you know, cascading risks and eventually you hit tipping points and, you know, someone could sit there and sort of explain how that all happens. Would everyone then vote in the right direction? I'm just not so sure that's the case, right? There are other areas of society, like it took us forever to stop smoking, even though we knew for X number of years that this was not a good idea. And there are still people smoking. So knowledge doesn't necessarily lead to action. So what's your what's your response there? Is it a combination? We need to know more, but then we need to make choices as well. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, knowledge very much does not automatically lead to action in this case. I think that we need to not so much know more as equip people with better tools for thinking so that they can come to appropriate decisions on their own. And, you know, that's always been kind of the premise of liberal education. But if you go back to the early days of the thermonuclear era, Bertrand Russell, one of the most important, as we mentioned earlier, popularizers of the awareness that, as he said, um, mankind is in peril, uh, universal death is around the corner. Uh, He later in his autobiography reflected on how surprised he was. He thought that all I had to do was make people aware of the universality of the danger And then they would automatically do the right thing and remove it because if they have any sort of minimum modicum of self-interest that all of our economic theories presuppose, then they must necessarily get rid of this existential risk to everything that they know and love. And he said, you know, I was disappointed and surprised at how little self-preservation the human species seemed to have. And similarly, there's been an assumption on both sides of the global warming debate that uh, once enough people were made aware of the existence of uh, human-driven uh, planetary heating, then they would automatically do the right thing and begin to um, mitigate their fossil fuel use. And this is precisely the sort of thinking that led the fossil fuel industries to engage in all those decades of obfuscation. But in the last couple of years, as the kind of early impacts of climate change have begun to bite, and very few people even maintain the facade of climate denialism anymore, it's become very clear that there's no sort of obvious consensus position that emerges from the facts. You've got some people who are saying that we need hardcore mitigation and adaptation. You've got other people kind of wringing their hands, excitedly thinking about the trillions of dollars they can make through carbon capture and sequestration. And then you've got more and more people who are excited about solar geoengineering as a way to blunt global warming. So yeah, definitely knowledge does not uh, lead to automatic solutions, absent uh, giving people the conceptual tools to really think through them. So I think this, you know, this has been a fantastic discussion. I, I had hoped to go a little bit more into some individual papers, but I think, I guess I'll just have to invite them on, on the podcast. I want to ask you as sort of a last uh, kind of question instead, the future of, of this field based on what, you know, you, you've been researching the history of it and you've now at Stanford taken it up to contemporary times. And we've had this uh, discussion around the, uh, the, our conference pres- uh, and the proceedings that are now available as a document, which you expertly edited with me, and uh, you obviously uh, 
got it out there and it's available for everyone to see and people I think should, should, should read some of those contributions. But instead of going into the details of those, I want to ask you, what do you think is next for the X-Risk field? How, what will the next decade look like in, in your mind? Uh, w- w- what would it look like for you? What will it look like for the field? And what does it look like for, for the planet? It's tiny little questions. Yeah, wow, you're just really wrapping up with a bow here. Um, what it'll look like for me, who knows? Uh, <clears throat> I have found that my own home discipline of political science seems to be pretty uninterested in the way that I'm approaching these questions. So personally, career-wise, who can say? Um, <clears throat> at a broader level, what the future of existential risk studies looks like is fairly uncertain. Uh that's it, been neat seeing it institutionalized in places like the Future of Life Foundation, CSER, FHI, uh, the Kate Hamburg Center for Apocalypse and Post-Apocalypse Studies in um, Heidelberg. But at the same time, these institutions all subsist on grants, and there's no guarantee that the money will continue to flow. And the history, there was nearly a nuclear studies movement in the 1980s that would have done what a lot of existential risk studies today is doing in terms of looking at how these threats arose and kind of the complex cultural interactions that arise uh, as a result. And it kind of died on the vine. And I think there's a real risk that I mentioned that cyclicality earlier, people might find that the um, intensity and just kind of harrowing nature of thinking about these things in public in the way that we have for the last couple of years is too much to bear. And the topic falls off a cliff like it did In the 1960s, mentions of nuclear weapons fell by about a fourfold factor across everything from films to comic books to scholarly journal articles. So there's a chance people might want to put their heads back in the sand. But the difference today is that we're just facing so many more risks. If it were only nuclear weapons, you could pray that they remain in their silos. But AI is going to keep advancing. The climate and global ecology is going to continue collapsing. So there's no way to look away. I think the real question will be whether you can have a kind of responsible, coherent, and generally goodwilled existential risk field that is able to provide uh, measured, actionable policy proposals, or whether uh, the kind of failure to address these topics for decades leads to increasing radicalization and um, the rise of something much more extreme that... um, could really kind of tarnish the whole X risk field, kind of, you know, not uh, doomsday cults, uh, terrorist activities, et cetera, that would really make um, X risk kind of toxic. I, I find that so interesting. And I think it's uh, an understudied and under debated uh, thing, which is the motivations that people have to come to towards this issue. And obviously that colors the solutions they suggest. What uh, do you think really the prospects are for one field when we know that, you know, you characterized it as kind of two different movements and those were the academic movements. So the earth system movement and the information science kind of movement. But if you, uh, I guess, drill in uh, or, you know, use more, more of a microscope, there, there's so much more. And like you said, they're not all academic, uh, you know, approaches. They, some of them are social movements. Uh, some of them are networks. Uh, they are even elite networks. You could sort of say that uh, the Davos kind of crowd and, you know, not to pick on any organization, but, you know, any sort of elite network. And you have billionaires, constellations and individual billionaires that are now kind of, cat- uh, you know, uh, climbing so rapidly and fast. You know, you, you will have the world's first trillion dollar companies, uh, you know, and, and all of these actors are non-state um, and then you have states and what will happen to this, to the states and whether they are salient actors, you know, will there still be uh, one superpower or a, a few superpowers? So the question is, are there ways that you can kind of align these motivations or you as a political thinker, do you, do you think that this, um, territory of X risk, you know, is Machiavellian and it's going to be just, you know, there's going to be some dominant voices that just rule the state of nature here and and start dominating the debate the way it perhaps was with this 80s uh, 
uh, you know, X-Swiss community before the Earth science people kind of, I guess, came back with a vengeance, uh, proving that the Earth is not going so well. So we need to take that into account as well in, in X-Risk. Um, I mean, it's, it's a weird question, but I'm just saying, is it a state of nature inside of this field? And, and if it's not, what are the gr ground rules? Yeah, well, I mean, I can certainly imagine a future in which my Amazon Prime memberships give me more benefits than my citizenship rights, uh, depending. But I, I think that what's really at issue here is how people respond. There's been a lot of really ugly responses to the early effects of global warming, the resulting migrant crises that have led people towards nativist, more far-right positions that are really cruel and callous and kind of a willingness to let millions of people die for the sake of preserving uh, what you can of your current way of life. And then there have been other people who've taken a much more kind of traditionally enlightenment, universalistic view of we're all in this together and we need to help all human beings. And I think the real danger would be the rise of um, things like eco-fascisms, uh, billionaires continuing to build their own bunkers and try to ride out the coming collapse that they are causing uh, to the detriment of the rest of us. And I think the important thing that existential risk studies can do, especially in the more kind of um, systemic um, cascading risks approach that we've been trying to foster is to make re people realize that it's not just a platitude to say that we're all in this together and that everything's connected that there's so many technological cats out of the bag when it comes to AI, when it comes to synthetic biology, that if you think that there can be, you know, justice without peace, uh, survival without equality, uh, you're delusional. The best ways that we have to prevent existential risk is making the world a better place for everyone and doing that as quickly as possible. And, you know, building resiliency and the health of communities everywhere that will prevent uh, radical fringes of disaffected people from using the technology that's ra ra you know, rapidly falling into more and more hands to cause uh, existentially risky scenarios. So we really are at a fork in terms of trying to, uh, you know, lifeboat ethics, save who you can, uh, go become emperor of Mars, et cetera, or really commit to longstanding uh, principles that were mostly honored in the breach to, you know, elevate everyone to a, you know, dignified and sustainable way of life. So, Dan, this has been fascinating. I'm going to give you the last word, but I'm going to give you a hard question to, to end this. Oh, the hard so questions I'm, start now? Yeah, this is the hard question. So here, here are three scenarios for, for the future. Which one is more likely and which one do you prefer? So the first one is universalist global democracy. Um, this idea of you know some sort of revamped UN that actually is democratic, that rules, and does it in a way that uh, tolerates people. And, uh, and diversity and, and, and good things and has solid governance of all of these risks. Number two is this idea of a totalitarian security state, whether it's global or national or some combination, but this idea that you cannot have de-risked societies without totalitarian control. And then the third is this idea of distributed uh, innovation and degrowth that we can all basically disperse, do our own thing in community and peer-to-peer, -peer, and that that is the way forward, slowly dismantling capitalism into something else that's at least not faster, but preferably slower. It may not just mean the eradication of property rights, but it certainly means a deceleration of all of these changes in, in a, at a magnitude that makes, makes a difference. So uh, universalist, totalitarian, distributed which one's more likely hmm. uh, more likely totalitarian obviously i think that is very much the direction that uh, ai systems autonomous weapons etc are going just in terms of the total power that they confer to smaller and smaller numbers of people to manage larger and larger numbers i, I don't know that you can necessarily get to the distributed degrowth model without some sort of um totalitarian takeover I, I don't know that people would uh the people in power would democratically um allow that i mean ultimately what i think is at issue here uh i'm not qualified to make that choice i think that for the last 75 years when the thermonuclear weapons were first appearing on the horizon 
people realized that they forced a really difficult and kind of unprecedented choice between freedom and life. Mm-hmm. That do we maintain our um, current freedoms and are we willing to jeopardize all life to uh, sustain them? Or will we accept life under any conditions that are given to us if the people that do that can at least guarantee our survival and in the face of these technological threats? So it's always going to be really tempting to just kind of totally surrender your freedom to some sort of totalitarian administration that promises you will at least be able to live under whatever circumstances I deem are required, some sort of, you know, total ubiquitous surveillance, et cetera. And then conversely, um, also really appealing for kind of a libertarian strain to say that, you know, uh, give me liberty or give me death, freedom overall, uh, better to, you know, live as a human than die as a slave. And there's just decades of um, pent up need to question what our values are and to what extent we are willing to surrender our freedoms for the sake of survival. And we need to, I think, before we begin to answer which of those three different approaches is best or more feasible, establish a sort of global fora where people can really engage in these questions of deeper values and come to some degree of um, agreement concerning what we're willing to give up for the sake of a more safe and sustainable world. Otherwise, the inevitable drift will be towards some sort of totalitarian oligarchy. Dan, I, I thank you for that. And I think that's that's fair enough. I'm not going to force you to choose. I, I guess maybe leaving this on a cliffhanger then, because the question for me, at least, is one of representation and, and the, the the impossibility currently of, of fair representation. Because, you know, if you think about, and I worry about this, this is another podcast, we could talk about this for a long time, but this idea of democracy as something where you write a document and then agree that some group that you either elect or otherwise is going to, going to represent you. It sounded fantastic a couple of hundred years ago, but it seems to me that it is really, really under attack from both legitimate and illegitimate sides of the coin. And I wonder just you know, in the last second or two, what do you think? So you think the answer to the representation problem, who shall represent Dan in and in what for? Is, is that another discussion? And can it be figured out? I mean, is that what we're hoping for? That we that we discuss this question seriously? Yeah, I mean, it, it's just a, a question that's been looming for a century. We've got planetary means of communication, but no planetary governance. And so how do you square that? I think there are a bunch of really exciting ways that we could produce um, more subsidiarity that increases, uh, just maximizes democratic engagement at all relevant levels. But, you know, there are also going to be issues where you don't have time to spend years building consensus through various layers of democratic organizations and then their representatives who convene democratically. So, yeah, again, um, I, this is kind of a call to all political theorists. These are urgent questions that need to be delved into you know, much more deeply than they have been before. And if that means throwing out some of our you know, most cherished, longstanding um, political anchor points, then that might be worth doing if they've become dead weight. Dan, on that note, I thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. I've learned a lot and I hope people will We'll, we'll go to some of the sources that we talked about and check out the conference proceedings. And thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Trond. And yeah, like you say, I had a list of eight or nine abstracts from the conference proceedings for papers that are all outstanding. Go check them out. Thanks so much. All right, Dan. Bye. Wonderful. You have just listened to another episode of the Futurized podcast with me, Trond Arne Unheim, futurist scholar and author. If you are interested in my products or services, feel free to check out futurized.org slash store, where you can book a keynote speech, become a sponsor or partner, request a podcast swap, or buy a few of my books, such as Augmented Lean, Health Tech, Future Tech, Pandemic Aftermath, Disruption Games, or Leadership From Below. If you're interested in any or all of my projects, check out my website, trondundheim.com, which has links to other podcasts as well as my public appearances. Thank you. Please share this show with those you care about. To find us on social media is easy. We are Futurized on LinkedIn and YouTube and Futurized 2 on Instagram and Twitter. See you next time. Futurized. Conversations that matter.